everyone, and welcome to this episode of Freedom Hub's Working Group. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with my co-host, Charles Froman. We've got another great guest lined up for us this week. We do want you to know that our programs are sponsored and also recorded. So just as a little reminder, we are recorded at a number of channels. This main link is for those that are not already subscribed and want to get a weekly notice. Otherwise, we're on the some of the top channels that are out there. And just to show you for a quick second, here's a good example where we're on BitChute. And as you'll see, there's an awful lot of videos that go back a long time and a lot of great ones to share and to review. And even though some of them might be a little bit old, they're still as fresh as yesterday. We are being sponsored by your Freedom Hub, where you're going to find out all these disruptive activities that we talk about on this weekly show. And then also really quick, we have another little great sponsor with us and this is what the what we've discovered to be one of the only i should say i think the only bioactive product on the market in the hemp space and so this is something really very special you'll want to check out we've got a very special code for our members to try and i think you'll discover some very personal responses to it so please take advantage of that now for today we've got a really exciting guest i'm gonna let charles kind of give us a nice rundown here and I think we're going to get quite a little earful as to where we are today, since we're living in, as the judge himself said, in some very interesting times. That we are, Jeff and Judge Gray. Welcome. It's a pleasure to, to have the judge talk about the election since he was a vice presidential candidate himself eight years ago uh, and again uh, this year for president. Now, he is a retired Superior Court judge from Southern California who made a name for himself by being one of the highest ranked uh, you know, political figures, even though he's a judge, uh, to call for an end to cannabis prohibition, which was quite controversial back in the 1990s when he made that comment. Uh, lately, over the past decade or so, he has been active as a private dispute adjudicator for contracts. Anyone who understands judicial reform knows about the power of private adjudication of disputes. Uh, he does have a few books, including a voter's handbook that you can see there, uh, and two paragraphs for liberty. And indeed, this will be sort of a handbook for voters uh, tonight, uh, today. You know, what do we do with Trump, Biden, Joe Jorgis, and other candidates how important uh, is the election uh, compared to other ways to get liberty? So we'll have a wide ranging discussion today, Jeff. All right, very, very good. Well, Judge, I'm gonna give you the floor here and please regale us with some well, interesting I, words of wisdom, please. I promise that you'll get what you pay for, Jeff, but uh, <laughs> it's just nice to be with good people. And I, I met Charlie in the 2012 election and campaign, uh, just really good, solid people. And it's just nice to share thoughts. There are lots of thoughts out there. We as libertarians actually do things that work. Uh, we have seen in the past with this COVID-19 virus, and I can jump right into it if you want, that the politicians have responded politically. So if I am a mayor, I am a governor, I'm going to do everything I can to keep you safe. No, I'm gonna close down the economy on, by the way, I'm gonna take keep tens of millions of people away from their jobs unnecessarily close hundreds of thousands of businesses, but I'm going to keep you safe. So if you stay safe and you don't get this virus, I was successful. I'm a hero. And if you do, oh, you can't blame me. I did everything I could. But they needed libertarian courage. They needed to say, look, wait a minute. It's the individuals that should make these decisions. That if I have a hardware store, for example, I'm going to advertise, look, I put in a new filtration system. Every half hour, we get 98.7% of the molecules out of the air. Uh, I'm a small hardware store. We're going to take your temperature before you come in. That's true with my customers as well as my employees. We're going to have space. We're going to have only 10 at a time or whatever. But what the government did, oh, no, I'm not an essential business, arbitrarily said, but I'm not an essential business. So I'm closed down. So now you go to Home Depot, you've got a Costco, and while you're there and buying your fruits and vegetables and clothing, you also buy my hardware. So you have closed me down and helped my competitor. And it's probably more dangerous from a health standpoint for you to go to Home Depot than it would be to come to my small hardware store. Individuals, the customers, the consumers should see what is offered. And if I'm 80 years old and I have pneumonia, I ain't going. 
But if I'm healthy and, and I'd rather go to your local hardware, Froman Hardware or, or uh, Cantor Clothing, uh, I'm going to do that. Let me make that decision. Some mistakes will be made, but Charlie, Jeff, you know that it causes harm to decimate the economy, and that's what we've seen. They don't have political courage. Libertarians would have addressed this totally differently. By the way, I'm on a roll here, but by the way, a libertarian government would have had a plan in place before the emergency happened, because it could be an earthquake, it could be a hurricane, it could certainly be a pandemic. By the time it happens, it's too late. The government failed us up, down, and sideways. We need more libertarians in government. Other than that, I have no opinion whatsoever. That's strong stuff, Judge. Um, <clears throat> and controversial. People really are getting angry in social media when you do express an opinion outside the dominant narrative. Uh, and you're sometimes being censored uh, by the, the tech companies when you do utter a maverick opinion. What do you think about uh, Silicon Valley censorship of maverick doctors and maverick scientists, you know, who sometimes have controversial information that could be wrong, maybe sometimes could be better than what, they're, what we're getting from the dominant narrative. What about censorship on tech, technology? The, the answer is no. I mean, if they knowingly assist slander or that sort of thing, but let me, let me, I'm going to answer your question this way, Charlie. One of the triumphs I had as a parent, I had two, three children. They were, say, seven, seven, and four years old. We were driving down a rural area, and we were going by a strawberry field, and they have plastic on there, and I guess they're used, you know, they poke holes in them so the plants come out, and they keep high humidity in the soil or keep them clean or whatever, and I said, look, kids, that's where they raise plastic. Oh, really, Daddy? Oh, really? And I didn't say anything, and maybe four or five miles down the road, one of my sons said, oh, come on, Dad. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up now is we all must challenge the information that we receive. And we should not be filtered from it. We should be able to challenge it. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Like we used to say, oh, it's in writing, so you know it must be true. It's on television, it must be true. No, we have an obligation to try to filter this ourselves. We're not going to have censorship because sometimes those things are correct, by the way. And sometimes as well, it's just challenging. I just don't believe in that type of censorship. Now, am I going to allow people to advertise how to make a nuclear bomb? Well, probably not. So now you're, you're getting into gradations. But by and large, if it's close, we do not allow any of that censorship. Not in our country. Uh, thanks, Judge. Charlie here. Let's take that sideways to the uh, racial protests. And I think all of us feel bad for classes of folks that maybe have had it tougher than others. At the same time, couldn't that same argument be made for some of these old classic statues with figures who are good in some way and bad in other ways? Uh, can their bad be a lesson for us to learn their bad or should we erase their history and use that filter? Well, the answer to all of those questions pretty much is yes. We have a process. We have to decide, Charlie, if we are going to abide by the rule of law or not. I happen to believe this is a really good idea. So if you don't like a particular statute, it could very well be that a former Confederate Civil War general should not, we're, it's not our spirit any longer, and we shouldn't have that person glorified. So we have a political process, abide by the process. And I assure you, politicians are responsive. And if you go to your city council and say, I don't think that uh, General, you know, Davis should be should still have the statue, they'll respond. But what you do not do is become a vigilante. You do not do self-help. It's called a crime. If you're going to destroy government property, private property, it's called a crime. Even Rosa Parks, by the way, you have to be able to stand up and, re, and, and be respect, responsible for your actions. She did, she's a hero. But if you're going to do that, it's a crime and you should be responsible for it. It's a small step from there to looting, to arson, no, we, those are crimes and they should be prosecuted. But use the political process and you'll, you'll get a much more rational result and you'll get a responsive result. That's my answer. To that end, and we're getting here really in your bailiwick, judicial reform. Let's expand on that topic a bit. Uh, let's mention some of the proposals. I think libertarians uh, have had the best proposal that maybe won't get much traction. Uh, you know, some element of prohibition repeal, number one. And then, of course, there's the partial immunity 
uh, issue, which is complicated. And then there are some union issues where the unions uh, protect bad cops. Uh, this is your world. Uh, so run, run us through some of the proposals and what you would do uh, respectfully respond to the, to the complaints Charlie, out there. It so happens that uh, I wrote an article that appears in this month's Verdict magazine. It's a uh, magazine for, for prof legal professionals, and it's called uh, Life Inside Prisons. And the, the genesis of it was last July 4th, a year ago, I was on a radio show called Coast to Coast with George Nury, and it gets quite a listenership. And we were talking about criminal justice reform and specifically the repeal of drug prohibition. And it turned out that there were numbers of, of in, uh, inmates who were listening to the show. And I received letters from 11 inmates from around the country. And we started kind of becoming pen pals. And I said, look, I'm interested in knowing what life is like inside prisons. And I quoted Dostoevsky who said, you can tell most about a society by walking into its prisons. Not how we treat our, our exemplary people, but how we treat our prisoners. How do you think we'd be doing today? So they responded and I end up writing this article, which I'm pretty proud of. And I also gave some recommendations about how to improve the criminal justice system. And a huge one is body cameras for police officers. Huge, because if everybody knows, including the police officer, that this is going to be recorded, everybody will be, be on their best behavior. And by the way, much of the time, most of the time, the police will be shown to have done the right thing. But we need that transparency. We need to have those body cameras. We also have to get away from, from public employees unions, police unions. I wrote an article, in fact, I write a pod called uh, Two Paragraphs for Liberty every week. Last week, I wrote that you cannot both be in favor of police, re police unions as they now exist, as well as police reform, because they will not allow the, we call them bad apples, to be fired. You cannot get rid of them. Even this guy in Minnesota had something in the order of 12 serious charges, allegations against him. They couldn't get rid of him. So these are things that we need to look at, we need to address, and we need to change. Uh, there, there are others as well, certainly drug prohibition. Over-incarceration is out of control. Richard Nixon is the evil, is the goat on this one, that they knew, by the way, they knew, according to his own Attorney General Kleindies, who wrote a law review article about it thereafter, they knew that drug treatment worked and incarceration did not, but during the height of the Vietnam War, the racial issues, they decided that they would use the drug laws against marijuana, for example, against those hippies, against the ones that were protesting the war in Vietnam, as well as the, the heroin laws against blacks, and put them in jail. And it worked be amazingly well. To the degree that, Charlie, and this is horrendous, the United States of America has 5% of the world's population, 5% of the world's population, and 25% of its prisoners. There was a federal uh, U.S. senator named Jim Webb from Virginia who was faced with those, those numbers and said, either the United States of America is the most criminally oriented people in the world, or we're doing something wrong. Which do you think it is? And of course, we all know. So these are things that we simply must address and only libertarians really are addressing them good for us. It's time that we do more. Fantastic. Uh, David, I see you've got your hand up. Hi, Judge. Um, most folks would consider Rosa Parks' actions as legitimate civil disobedience. And we know that some bad laws won't change without civil disobedience. And particularly during uh, the pandemic, uh, where do you draw the line on civil disobedience? I don't. I don't at all, David, and thanks for the question. You have to be able to take, be responsible for your actions. I got an illegal haircut. Okay, you know, I weighed the op options. I'm in my 70s. I didn't want to get sick. Uh, I knew the barber. I knew that he was wearing a, a mask. Uh, I was wearing a mask at the beginning until it fell off. But, but okay, that was civil disobedience, I suppose, on a small scale. But had they come in, tried to arrest me or whatever, I, would, I wouldn't have escaped. I would have been good for it. Rosa Parks was a hero because she stayed here. She did it intentionally. Here I am. This is what I'm doing. This law is wrong. What are you going to do about it? And I think that's great. Now, if you're going to loot, you know, and you, you have a mask on and you run away, uh, that's not civil disobedience. That's simple criminal conduct. As you know, during the... Uh... Uh, current uh, Libertarian uh, Party uh, 
arguments. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, discussion about uh, some obsolete uh, bylaws, and uh, some folks appear to be hiding behind uh, out-of-date bylaws regarding how to hold conventions, and other folks say, uh, you know, there's the impossibility clause. We need to move on. We need to use uh, bylaws as guidelines, but they aren't principles, and sometimes you need to fix them. Any thoughts on the current uh, Libertarian Party convention gate argument? Kind of. There's only so much that any people can do, and I'm more uh, a face man of, of policy. I've never gotten into the, the bylaws as such. Um, I can't say I don't care, but uh, uh, there's only so much that I can do. I know that they're talking about one on abortion now. Abortion is a very difficult subject, an emotional subject. I think we should just basically say, as far as our bylaws are concerned for libertarians, it's a very emotional, difficult area, and we have no position. But uh, otherwise, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of, we, we need all kinds, and we need the, the people that are, that are uh, in there digging into the bylaws, but that's, that's just not me. So I don't have that much of an opinion on it. Uh, Judge Gray, Charlie here. Uh, getting back to your letters with inmates, there's a libertarian conversation there on the ideal punishment, incarceration, restitution. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, Senator Webb's concern about the over incarceration. How do we make, uh, you know, private prisons are here to stay. Uh, you know, every bureaucracy is controlled by industry and they're, they're going to get what they want. How can we change the law so that whatever prisons end up being, whatever nature they have, how can we make, how can we make them better, more useful well, for inmates, more useful for society? How do we fix that problem? For treating them Charlie, I, I happen to believe that private prisons are just fine. Uh, they're uniform pretty much in England. They work well. They're less expensive. They're safer. They actually teach uh, job skills. I think that we should have a incentives for wardens, for example, that if they lower the recidivism rate for people that were in your, your facility, the more you'll get paid or the more you'll get recognized. Uh, it isn't a question of private prisons. I think they're better, but it's a question that you should not have anyone in the private sector deciding how many people would be there, who would be there or for how long. That's a public function. But otherwise, I think private prisons are fine. Immediately people say, oh, no, no, they're going to lobby. They're going to well, look, who do you think the prison guards unions are doing? So if somebody's going to lobby, we might as well expect that, but the private sector does it better than the public sector does by a bunch. Yeah, that was sort of a diversion. I agree with you, uh, private pr prisons are here to stay. So how do, you mentioned the warden incentive. Have you seen some examples of good prisons? How do we get there? I am working with a group called Open Gate International. And they're a wonderful group. They're a private foundation. And what they do is teach culinary arts. They teach people to be chefs, for example. So if you're released from prison, you're on parole, you can go to this 12-week class for free and, and learn to be a chef, learn to be a maitre d', whatever. They also do that for women that have been sexually trafficked and also recovering drug-addicted people. I introduced them to the warden at Norco State Prison here in Southern California. Now they're starting to put in a program there to teach them to be chefs while they're still in prison. Why wait for them to get out? These things work. Now, there are other things, and I mentioned them in my article. Uh, it's important to learn a job skill, and it's important to work when you're in prison. Well, the prisons, prisoners that were, I was talking to say, okay, there's an incentive you can work, but you get paid somewhere between six cents an hour and 15 cents an hour while you're working. That's not a huge incentive. Plus, a lot of these prisoners have restitution ordered as a part of their sentence. So they take 70% of whatever they make and give them to the victims. So they, they really don't have an incentive to work. We, put, we have to change incentives. Let me, I, I say this directly. I came up with this quote, okay? So I'll, you write it down and I'll sign it for you. Incentives matter. That oh, it's original with, well, not quite, uh, but uh, incentives matter. We need to put the incentives where they should be. Put the incentives on staying away from crime. But if you have someone that's, say they're drug addicted and they go to prison and by and large, they're not gonna get any particular drug rehabilitation when they're in prison. 
So then they get out and I want to do better. I want to live a better life. I don't want to waste my time in prison, but I can't get a job. A lot of job skills take a, take a permit and you can't even apply for the permit if you're a felon. That's really dumb. Tree trimmers, people to braid hair, and all, all kinds of different stuff, even mechanics, that, that sort of thing. No. So what do I do? I want to be a, to live a better life. I want to support my family. I want to get a job, and I can't. So I get depressed. Hmm, what happens? I'm drug addicted. I have this background, and I'm depressed, and I can't get a job. I'm going to go back and take drugs. So my Norco State Prison I just talked to you about, when I was on a tour of that place, they told me that they have an 85% recidivism rate within a year. They might as well almost not let them out because there are a lot of drug addiction. They can't get a job. They get discouraged. They take drugs. They test dirty on a drug test. And they're back in prison. That really it harms everybody, everybody. And I tell people, and, and now we'll go back to drug prohibition, David, but, or Charlie, but it makes as much sense to me to put Robert Downey Jr., that gifted actor, in jail for his, for his heroin problem. And he's always had that craving and making good movies now, but he'll have to be careful. He'll have that craving. It makes as much sense to me to put Robert Downey Jr. in jail for his heroin problem as it would have Betty Ford in jail for her alcohol problem. Of course, she was the wife of President Gerald Ford, self-acknowledged alcoholic. It's the same thing. It's a medical issue. Bring them closer to medical professionals that can help them instead of rendering them automatic criminals and pushing them farther away. But if they drive a motor vehicle impaired by, you name it, methamphetamines, marijuana, alcohol, which is my drug of choice, that's a crime. What's the difference? Critical issue. What's the difference? Now, by my actions, I'm putting your safety at risk. Legitimate criminal justice issue. So I've seen I was in the criminal justice system for, as a judge for 25 years and a prosecutor before that, the design, the system is designed to protect us from each other. It's good at that, but it's not designed and is woefully ineffective at protecting us from ourselves. It's just not their function. So if I'm gonna take these drugs and it makes as much sense to me as a libertarian or any right thinking individual from my standpoint, it makes as much sense to me to have the government protect and control me, what I put into my mind as an adult, is it what I, I put into my body? It's none of their business, none of their business at all. And then we'll get back to what the government really can do with this regard, protecting us from each other. In terms of protecting us from ourselves, it seems like in many instances, the court or whatever just readily flicks that person into the, into the prison systems. Is that kind of the divergent point where we need to kind of decide which way that person is to go? That, that's the actual excuse me, solution yes, in society? Yeah. At that juncture? Well, we put in a program in Orange County, California, where I'm from. In fact, I started it called Peer Court. You know, understand, it's really easy to get into the system. And once you're there, it's almost impossible to get out. So we would have what we called a diversion system, where the probation department would screen for juveniles, various delinquency, you know, smoking marijuana, ditching school, uh, joyriding in cars. Maybe they hit, hit somebody because she she mouthed off at your boyfriend or something, but, but we'd take these and actually have peers go to a different high school and panel a jury of high school kids that don't know the subject and ask questions and go back and forth. And then you would start realizing, for example, that parents expect, the, the children expect the parents to parent. They'd say, you know, look at the mother. You're not your child's friends. You're their, you're their parent. Did you think about that? That's different. So responsibility for your life. I would look at some of the subjects and say, okay, close your eyes, literally. Tell me your three closest friends. You don't have to tell me who they are. Now, do you have them in mind? Yes. Are they going to be successful within the next five or 10 years? No, probably not. Well, don't you realize that if you hang out with kids that will smoke marijuana, ditch school, talk back to their teachers, not go to classes, they'll not be successful, and you're probably going to do the same thing. But if you hang out with kids that are working hard, roll up their sleeves, going to be successful in life, you're probably going to be as well. So you tell me your friends, I'll show you your future. You know, that sort of thing. So not only do we get the subject thinking about this in my future, but you have the six or eight high school jurors thinking about this as well. Another 50 kids in the, in the classroom, in the audience, thinking about the same thing. So you focus on your future because you ask you, Charlie, how old are you? I'm 18. How old are you going to be 10 years from now? Only once did I get that question wrong. I'm going to be 28. Okay, what do you want your life to look like when you're 28? Now, we all know that 10 years is going to go by really quickly, but when you're 18, it's an eternity. Oh, I want to go to 
I want to be a medical doctor. I want to be an airline pilot. But don't you realize that if you were shoplifting at Target, I don't want a thief to, to work for me. Had you thought about that before? You no, know, that sort of thing. So, so you just focus on these. These things work. Restorative justice works where you have community policing, where policemen, I tell you, when I was raised, and I'm older than all of you guys, but when I was raised, my, my parents drummed it into me. Jimmy, if you get lost, what do you do? Answer, correct. I go to a policeman. He's my friend. Do you think parents teach children that anymore? We need to bring peace officers back and get rid of the military and the police and have them do to protect us and our property instead of protecting us from each other or expecting us from ourselves, I mean. And then you get into, now I'm rambling, but you get into things like traffic courts where you have ridiculous penalties for speeding, for example, and you have in Orange County where I'm from, three times whatever the penalty is, you have as a penalty assessment, they call it. So if I give you a $50 fine, you're gonna end up owing $200 by the time you get out. Most people can't afford that. So if you can't, then you don't pay it. Now you have a warrant issued for it. You know, we're using policing for profit. Police must be paid. They must be given a, a legitimate budget, but then you do not have them benefit by being involved in seizing automobiles or seizing jewelry or, or impounding cars. You don't do that. Again, incentives matter. We do not want them to participate in the booty. So these are fundamental problems that we have in our system that must be recognized and must be changed. You know, it's interesting that you made that comment because incentives do matter, like you said. And it's funny, we've switched all incentives around. I'm, I'm a car buff. So they used to always use the, what they call the 85th percentile. So they would monitor a road and see what 85% of the people drove just by themselves with no signage up or whatever so that that person felt comfortable at that speed. And then that's what became the posted speed limit. But now, like you said, suddenly now everyone has a vested interest in you're one mile over or this or that, or they got the automated photographic intersections. Everything has been perverted to create the wrong incentive, which you know, I, I just understand where they're coming from. Oh, look, we're going to get more money as a police department. But what you're doing, like you said, I've, I've created an enemy of everybody that's supposed to be my ally. It's unbelievable how we've allowed this to occur. It's, it's a terrible thing to see, Jeff. And and we'll get back to the war on drugs again. You find, particularly in minority communities, the police are seen as an occupying force. And uh, you know they, they come in there and they push people around. You, they have these military uh, vehicles sometimes too. They use them as battering rams or whatever else. No, the answer is demilitarize, demilitarize the police. Do not allow the police unions to keep bad apples from being fired. There's some fundamental changes, but what you do not do is tear down the statutes and loot and, and arson. But, but these are things that we need to look at. And if it isn't working, I'll talk to you all. If it isn't working, it's our fault. It's our government. And if it isn't working, it's our responsibility to fix it. And that's, and that's what it comes down to. And pretty much we have a lot of work to do. We've We're got, all a, lot, we've got a lot of work we to should, do. We should roll I have a question, feet. Jeff. Well, I have one a question. Quick, one um, quick side, just wait before you do let just a tail end on that one. So if that's the case, you know, it's kind of funny because of that police unions and all that, but yet we're no, they're not up there tearing down statues and decrying the idea of the teachers union, which is the equivalent problem that, that supposedly the police unions are representing. Same. That's the same thing, Jeff. The issue, in fact, as, as you know, I was seeking the libertarian nomination for president. The issue that I was going to go around the country was with school choice empower parents to choose where their government money is going to be spent for the education of their children, and as shown in Milwaukee and in New Orleans and in places in Florida, et cetera, if they have that ability, they will choose excellence. Because all the studies show that it's not a question of economics. If you have a good school, a child will, will learn equally well at a lower economic or a higher economic area. But we are failing our children by having these failing schools. And it's caused because you can't fire the teachers. Now, I came to Orange County, California, upper middle class and lived in Irvine. Why? Because they have good schools. So I had school choice. I could choose to, where to take my child. But if you're in a lower economic area, usually the teachers that can't teach or the, or the ones that are lazy are put down into the lower economic areas. and They don't have that ability. That's where they're failing our children. I wrote an op-ed piece. I couldn't get it published probably for obvious reasons. But it was an open letter to the ACLU, to NAACP, and MALDEF saying what I'm saying here. But 
the people that are your constituents ostensibly are the one whose children are being failed by the public schools or the government schools. Why are you not supporting school choice? Why are you not agreeing to get your, your, your constituents empowered to choose where their government money is going to be spent? And the answer is, of course, it's the teachers unions, but that's what I wanted to expose for some reason the somewhat liberal LA Times would not print my, uh, my op-ed piece. Surprise, surprise. Go ahead, Charles. So let's, let's expand on that campaign you just mentioned with school choice. What were some of the stump points when you were going to campaign in, in North Dakota or even during the primary? Um, in, in thinking of you know, what would you have been saying uh, against Trump and Biden as you focus on your priority stump points? Well, of course, it depends where you are. And you first of all, see how good the schools are or not. But one thing that we would use all the time. The libertarians, Charlie, are the only ones that stand for and represent people in the military. You know, we would require, before we put our military into battle zones and keep them there for longer than 60 days, we would require Congress to issue a declaration of war. None of this War Powers Act stuff that the Democrats and Republicans have done for decades. No, you make Congress say, okay, look, here's Vietnam, here's Iraq. Who is the enemy? What is our national security interest? What is our security threat? What are our goals? How will we know when we reach our goals? How can then we have an end strategy? That never would have happened in Iraq. And I was campaigning at that time, 2004, for US Senate in California. Anyone would listen. I say, if we put troops into Iraq, it will be the biggest mistake of my lifetime. And nothing has happened since that time to change my mind. No, you make Congress do this, and then they take responsibility for that action. Here, all they can do is slough it off to the, to the president so they can say, well, you know, we empowered him if it worked and it's his fault if it didn't. That's called political. No, the founders said exactly, Article 1, Section 8, it must be done by Congress. So no matter what small state we go in, that would be one thing we would talk about. Healthcare. Look, you do not say, I'm going to appeal, repeal Obamacare. You do not say that. I would, but I would replace it. What you do is say, no, we're going to replace Obamacare with a system of vouchers that people, based on a sliding scale and economic need, can use on the free market to purchase health insurance, to even use as co-pays if necessary. But if you just say, I'm going to repeal Obamacare, about 40% of the voters would think, you don't care about me. You don't care about my health, which is a loser. And we do care about people's health. I was in the Peace Corps. I do care about people. But if you would have that voucher system then, like with schools, same deal, where you can choose your own your supplier, you'd have the free market come back into play. You'd have competition. Today, I go to Dr. Froman. Doc, I've got a knee problem. What do you tell me? Oh, Jim, do you want an MRI? What goes through my mind? Well, let's see. I've got Anthem Blue Cross private insurance. I'm on Medicare. It's going to probably cost me $25 to have an MRI. Sure, why not? I might as well get the best. But if I'm paying for it myself out of my own funds, Dr. Froman, Jim, do you want a, an MRI? What am I going to say? Well, I don't know, Doc. What's it going to show me and how much it's going to cost? If you say that today, that's not, the doctors don't even know how much it's going to cost because cost is not a factor. I'm not paying it. You're not paying it. It's done administratively. So what happens? The costs go up. You talk about this in North Dakota. You talk about this everywhere. Bring competition back to the health system. Mr. Minnesota, Mr. North Dakota, Mr. Montana, have you ever heard of a situation in which the government started getting involved in the marketplace when the cost did not go up and the quality of services and goods went down. You can't. Education and healthcare are the two dramatic examples, but so is everything else. You know, the Bureau of Land Management, who, who takes better care of a house? David, who takes better care of a house, an owner or a renter? And the answer to that is easy. It's the owner because you have a vested interest in it. Who takes better care of grazing land? somebody that owns the property or somebody that's leasing it. So let's bring ownership back to all of this property that the Bureau of Land Management is, is possessing. They own something in the order of 85% of all of the land in Nevada. And in California, I think it's like 40%. And I'm not talking national forests or even military reservations, but just that land that's overseen by the Bureau of Land Management. Give it back to the states and recommend to the states that they auction it off to, to private individuals. There's no reason for government to own all this property. It just goes on and on. So these are things that I would certainly talk about in the Western United States. Get that land out of BLM. That's not Black Lives Matter, by the way. It's Bureau of Land Management. Get it out of the BLM. 
and, and provide it back to the states, who should then auction it to the people. What well, would um, you say against Trump and Biden more spe specifically? Have you thought about if you were the nominee, how you would hit them? Yes. Donald Trump has never spoken for me. I don't think he speaks for the United States. He has done some things I agree with. He has Betsy DeVos in school choice. She's not been effective, but, but you, will, you will get all of the good results from Trump, but without the bombast. We're going to be the unification team. We're going to bring people together. I was a judge for 25 years. I've learned to listen. And by the way, I was always interested in this. The word silent and the word listen have the same letters in them. It's a lost art. So I am trained to listen, to evaluate the credibility of the, of the people bringing me the information, evaluate the information itself, make a decision and explain it. Let's work together. We will put in a coalition government. I'm elected president, Larry Sharp is vice president. We'll put in a coalition government in our cabinet, certainly independents and libertarians, but also Republicans, also Democrats, if they agree with our philosophy of responsibility at all levels of society, equal opportunity, you know, live and let live, uh, don't tread on me, don't tread on anybody, that sort of thing. And then we're having these political problems. You're a Democrat, you're a Republican, well, talk with your people, let's get together and let's work these things out. Biden cannot do that. Trump will not do that. We will be a consensus, unif unifying candidacy. Thomas Jefferson, the ultimate libertarian, by the way, said after the, con after the ratification of the Constitution, he said, we're going to need a radical bloody revolution every generation to keep the vested interests at bay. Now, fortunately, the Constitution makes it doesn't have to be bloody, but how long has it been? You know, since the 1860s when the Republicans took over from the Whigs and look at all the vested interests that we have today. It's time to put in Abraham Lincoln's team of rivals in effect, a coalition government to pare back the size and power and intrusiveness of government. Republicans are just as bad as Democrats. There's no difference between them. You will get true change, true Latin. We'll get away from this polarization by voting libertarian. Be proud of your vote. Stand up for it. It's the right way to go. That's a great way to frame it because it's about earning the vote. I hear that all the time. Well, you know, you can't vote for so-and-so. It's like, no, they didn't earn my vote. If I don't want to go eat at McDonald's and I go to Wendy's, it's not like I feel shame to go eat there. If they made their food better, I'd go there. So it's not a function of that. One thing, I got another question, but you made me laugh because when you talked about whether you own it or lease it or whatever, well, there's a special road on the backside of Maui called the Road to Hana, which is unpaved. And at the beginning of the sign, it says off-road vehicles and four-wheel drive only, oh, also with a little asterisk, it says, and rental cars. <laughs> Because <laughs> you'll see nothing but Jeeps on there. But sure enough, there's that guy who rented the car at the airport, and there they are out on that road. There is no way authorized for a car to be on there. I was one of them. Me Great too. <laughs> Lots of beautiful waterfalls, too. Beautiful. Yeah. That, that Dave, but it's so true. But what you said, you know, it's a joke, but it's the truth, like any good joke. It's totally the truth. It's so fantastic. David, I see you got your hand up. Uh, Judge, speaking of uh, libertarians, libertarians have a goal of achieving freedom in our lifetimes. Well, I'm going to be 80 this year, and like you, I'm planning on sticking around for a while, but will we achieve freedom in our lifetimes, and how are we going to do it from your perspective? Well, it depends what you mean. Uh, we are free in many ways. Uh, my problem, David, is that if you have people that have escaped from tyrannical governments, and I don't care, it can be from Cuba, now Venezuela, North Korea, uh, China, wherever, they come here and they're living and, and bless them. They're pursuing the American dream and they're, and they're living the good life here in the United States. But they look askance, agog, really concerned about the direction our government is going. Our government is going in the direction of those governments they fled from. And they're right. Mostly people like me that were born here, oh, no big deal, you know, oh, that, that sort of thing should change. No, we should be really deeply concerned. True freedom, the only person that I can think of that had true freedom was Robinson Crusoe. He was on the, de on the desert island all by himself. No government, he just did whatever he wanted to and had true freedom. Then he found Friday, by the way, and now he started having rules and, and government. So anytime you're going to have society, you're going to have some restrictions. 
And, and so I'm not sure what you mean by freedom. We have some, but it's decreasing. That deeply concerns me. The United States of America has a tradition of more freedom than any country in the world. And by the way, now I'll toot my own horn a little bit because I'm really proud of this. I wrote with two other partners a musical called Convention. And it's called Convention, the Birth of America. And it's about the Constitutional Convention. So I really delved into the, the founders. In fact, a lot of the books behind me are about them. And I found out, of course, that all 55 delegates, they argued, they complained, they fought with each other about all kinds of things. The thing they all agreed upon, each one individually agreed, the most important function of government is protecting our freedoms and liberties from the encroachment of government. I'll say it again. The most important function of government is protecting our liberties from the encroachment of government. The number two most important was keeping us safe. So we were founded upon that freedom, founded upon limited government, less intrusion, less involvement, less money, less, less just get them out of our way government. And we've gotten away from that. And it's kind of like that frog, you know, and, and put them in a pot and then heat the water slowly. That's what we're seeing. And the, the water's getting really hot now. And our government is looking a lot more like the government of Venezuela. You can't believe it. Does it feel a little like that it's maybe darkest before the dawn, like it needs to get, you know, that severe? And this is our little subtle way of having that revolution like you described? Um, my crystal ball is as cloudy as anybody's, Jeff. But, uh, you know, I, I hope so. Uh, I, I've seen this, though, ever since Richard Nixon, you know, wage and price controls, uh, the war on drugs, uh, the Great Society, the Medicare, the, the, the involvement more in, in, the, in the government in, involved in the, in the marketplace. So if so, it's been, a, it's been a creeping problem for the last 30, 40 years. I hope so. It's, but I'm a libertarian and will be for life because we're the only ones that really are within that true founder spirit. And that's, but that's sort of why I made that comment is that, you know, we've seen that grow. The whole libertarian movement's grown. I mean, you can use to kind of one hand all the organizations. Now there's like zillions of them. It's all over the world. So yeah, as crummy as it seems on one side, then you see that other little bright spot. You think, well, maybe we're getting to the point where we're going to hit that tipping point. And this is just a system like a cornered rat fighting back very hard to not, you know, lose its slot. Well, I, I'd say more a cornered kangaroo, but I won't argue with you. But, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, um, I hope so. What are we going to do? Quit? No. no. I, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something else. On April the 22nd, I became a granddaddy and I'm proud of it. And in fact, on April 27th, just five days later, I was holding my new grandson in my arms, Hudson. And I was thinking to myself, looking down, what a miracle of birth, what a miracle child. And the second thing I thought of is, okay, Hudson, you are $76,000 in debt because of the deficit. Pay up. <laughs> Libertarians are the only ones that represent Hudson. The legacy we are leaving to our children and our mm. grandchildren is debt. And the deficit will cause inflation. It's just a question of when. And it's going to be horrendous. We're going to be gone one way or the other. But our, this is what we're leaving to our grandchildren. The Democrats and the Republicans are equally at, at risk on this. We fought a Iraq war on a credit card and added a trillion dollars to our budget. Now, recently, what? We've spent $3.2 trillion that we didn't have for various bailouts and all the rest, all of which are arbitrary and, and it's going to have to come from somewhere. It's going to yeah. come from my grandson. What are we going to do? Quit? And of course, the answer is no. What a great way to frame it. Charles, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, Judge, if we could get back to that hazy crystal ball and let's go to December of this coming year and predict what we'll see from the government, uh, whether Trump or Biden win. So what do you think, uh, and we can do Jorgensen too, but what do you see in, in the next few years in a second Trump administration compared to what you see, would see, might see in a Biden administration? What kind of changes in I law and effect on life? Charlie, from a candid standpoint, I do not see a Biden administration because I think he is over the hill. I think that he is has some problems mentally focusing. So it's going to be run by the Nancy Pelosi's of this world. And we're becoming extremely progressive, so-called in that regard. Government's going to be more and more and more involved. And uh, gosh, I, I quote Milton Friedman, who said, look, if you're going to look for these angels of government, his quote, 
Where have they been so far? You know, why are they going to be better for us tomorrow than they've been for the last week or the last couple of decades? So the government is not the answer. But if, if Biden is elected, his administration will become yet more progressive. There won't even be any form of opposition because, uh, uh, you know, there's only so much they can do in the Senate. Uh, if, if, if Trump is reelected, um, it will be... To, will be so divisive. We, we've become so polarized in our lives and it will only continue. Trump doesn't purport to speak for all Americans. He doesn't care about all America. He just cares about his power base. And uh, he is spending a lot of money on his power base. You even get to now uh, the Department of Treasury uh, secretary had a what? Slush fund of $600 billion voted by Congress to give to various cronies, basically, ones that, that uh, were hurt by the, the, uh, the COVID virus. Well, you know, they just give them to their cronies. Uh, I, I can't believe it, but they're only going to give money to and support to their supporters. And it's getting worse and worse with regard to this polarization, this tribalism, and it's going to only continue to get worse if we reelect Donald Trump. It's not a pretty picture. Vote George Jorgensen. David, I see you've got your hand up. Judge, uh, you mentioned uh, protection. So government uses explicitly protection and conflict resolution to justify their existence. From your experience in private arbitration, what do you see in the future for private conflict resolution as a way of increasing our freedoms that you correctly point out are headed in the wrong direction right now? Well, David, I see a very bright future for people like me in private dispute resolution, uh, but it's embarrassing. Uh, we're good at it. We can do it better uh, because I can give you a date certain and I can devote my time to it and I'm much more flexible, but it's only for the wealthy. Uh, I'm fairly expensive. I can help corporations. I can help people. I volunteer at various times as well, but the courts being closed uh, is a travesty. Uh, and, and it's mostly the wealthy people that can come to me. It's the, the people that do not have the funds that, that cannot, and that's not what our country is about. So I see us, we're becoming so much more bureaucratic. I talked about getting into the criminal justice system, which is easy and hard to get out, but it's also expensive just to bring a lawsuit. Uh, attorneys are expensive, all the rest of this. So more small claims are good. Small claims is kind of like town hall justice. I did them. I think that they're really important. There's a, there's a jurisdictional limit depending on, on what state you're in. I think in California, it's now like $12,500. When I became a judge, it was like $2,500, but, but that's good. But uh, we, we need justice, for, but for all is exactly what we need to do. And it's, it's getting farther and farther away. It's more remote. It's very discouraging to see. So uh, doctors uh, back before World War II had a very flexible pricing system. You know, uh, if they were uh, treating a broken leg and uh, the person was out of work, uh, they didn't charge them. If they were poor, maybe they charged them two chickens. If they were better off, they maybe took all the chickens in the hen house. Now, from the perspective of private arbitration, you're concerned about the cost for the poor people would you consider a similar type price structure for your clients? Well, um, David, we do that. Uh, I, I have a standing offer to friends who are on the bench, judges. If you have the case that needs to settle, I will volunteer my time. I will go to you and I will help you settle it. And I, they called me up on it and I've been successful each time. Uh, so, so we do that. I also reduce my rates, that sort of thing. I think the legal profession is, should really be able to take a couple of bows because we volunteer more than any other group that I'm aware of. But like you said, it was true before we got into the Medicare and the government involved in, in the healthcare system. People were not having problems particularly. There was not even a question of there weren't enough emergency rooms available. There wasn't a question that the poor were not getting medical care. Uh, hospitals were volunteering, donating their services. The private sector tends to do that. But if the government preempts it, then the private sector pulls back. Because why should I? Because the government has all of these various programs. So if you get it back, it the first George H.W. Bush, who had a thousand points of light 
it was misunderstood, but that was pretty much the idea. The private sector is a magnanimous sector. Again, I was in the Peace Corps. I care about people. Most other people do as well. So we're not going to let people starve to death. We're not going to, not because we have to. I'm sorry, Charlie. If I were bleeding on the street right here below your feet, you would have no legal obligation to help me whatsoever unless you caused my injuries. That would be different. But we will because we want to. We're compassionate people. I'm not entitled to it. Progressives, listen to this. I'm not entitled to it. Just because I'm alive, Jeff, does not mean you owe me anything. But we will because we want to. And so I adapted, actually, Milton Friedman's, he called it a negative income tax. I think there is an area below which people should not be allowed to fall in our country. Not because we have to, but because we're compassionate people. We would have that system. It would be tied to the income tax system and do away with all other welfare unless you have really uh, severe uh, personal needs. But, but that's what I would do. It didn't work well in the libertarian nomination, but it should have. And I think it's a very good system. Well, again, it's something you can't give up on. Let's ask a quick practical question, then we'll slip another one here before we have to conclude today. You know, obviously, we've seen this libertarian movement grow. This have seen the party grow. It's gotten more state ballots and whatnot. But yet somehow it's never been able, after 30-plus years, to break out into any meaningful way. And again, we can lay that to the feet of the fact that they don't seem to ever make it to those presidential debates. And the typical person figures, well, if you're not in that, then you must be nobody. And because they don't take any time to you know, look any deeper how do you turn the corner or start to get some traction when that's like that one singular hurdle that seems to be the biggest log jam of all there, there are two jeff one as you just mentioned that it's the so-called commission on presidential debates is made up of five high-ranking republican commissioners and five high-ranking democratic commissioners we even got because we brought a lawsuit against them in 2012 we got their documents their documents said the purpose for this commission is to allow the Democrats and Republicans to put their information before the voters. Not nonpartisan, not tripartisan, just bipartisan. And of course, it's power, and they do not want a third person at the table. By the way, if a third person were at the table, they'd be required to discuss issues that they're not that they duck right now. You know, all the wars, all the healthcare problems, all the lack of education. All, if a libertarian or anyone else were there, at least we'd make them focus on that. But the second is that we must support what we call down ballot candidates. We must find really good, articulate, dedicated, probably younger people to run for city council or commissioner or water board or that sort of thing and show people what libertarians actually do when they're in office. Whoa, I like that idea. Let's get more of those. I want you to go up the next rung and go to the state capitol and be in the assembly or whatever. And we haven't done that particularly. Larry Sharp has in New York. We're starting to around the country. I'm trying to help down ballot candidates. Now I found some, some really, really excellent ones. We've got to build both at the same time, up at the president for the, for the uh, debates and also down below to bring, the, uh, bring those candidates into play. That's a great response, and, and, and that's kind of what I've felt has always been meaningful. Because for people that told me, why would I vote for you for president when that's, you know, it's like you're going for the biggest position ever. Maybe you should try to go for, like, you know, dog catcher or something so I get acclimated to you before I'm going to think to vote for you for president. It seems so, you know, audacious. We, we had a little guest slip in here. Bruce, are you there? Did you maybe have a quick question for the judge here since you had a chance to jump in here in the last minute? I've got you unmuted. Well, while you're listening, let me give you, before we're, we're done, because I love play on words, and the best play on words I think I've ever heard is, what do you get when you mix an elephant and a rhinoceros? And I know this has been on your mind. Bruce, I know you were going to ask about this too, but what do you get when you mix an elephant and a rhinoceros? And the answer is, elephino. <laughs> I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> very Not cute. Bad. That's very cute. Well, that was great. I'll tell you, we, we had a great time here today. Let me kind of conclude here for us a little bit. Oh, and as you made that comment, I happened to bring this thing up. This was Joe's site here as an example. Can you see my screen or no? Let me share. No, you cannot. Hold on a sec. Let me. There you go. Okay. So yeah, here you were talking about. So this is this is a ticket that everybody should be cognizant of whether they're going to vote for them or not. But like you said, it's going to force those other parties to talk about the topics they just don't seemingly want to discuss. So if anything, that's the advantage that a third party brings. Win or lose, they force the others to try to match up. We've Absolutely. definitely got this handbook of yours, so this would be great for everyone to check out and, well, and to keep an and eye on what you're up to. Just, 
go to judgejimgray.com and all of these things are basically there. There, there it is there. And there's What's your that? great little paper page. that you just put up. I know we talked about this. This is a great one. Here's who would be a beneficiary. And then here would be ideally who would end up being the losers, which of course are the problems that we continue to live with. So it's great that you're bringing attention to all of this for all of us. My I pleasure. Do, I do appreciate that. So thanks again. And then just on the tail end here, let's do a little quick close out here. We, we do have an added sponsor. Again, what we're trying to do is to get to the areas where we can solve problems and rather interesting based on today's thing. We'll notice this there. They're promoting that they've got their homeopathic cures for all sorts of stuff, including all sorts of viral infections. Well, what do you know? So there are solutions out there that we're not being cognizant of. And in this particular instance, this is a leading edge company that we've uncovered. And in this instance, this particular Dr. Laird will allow you to, to take advantage of a free visit, which would be normally 250 bucks until the 31st with this special code. If you go to their website, and you get to find out about your own self and all the rest of the things that affect you that you're probably not going to hear from mainstream medicine. So definitely appreciate you being here today.